Good morning. It's an honor to be here today, and I'm excited to talk to you all about how the healthcare system can improve the ways that it connects patients to high-value care. So to start off, I'd like you all to imagine a world where we can all agree on how to measure quality and efficiency in healthcare. I know that probably sounds a little bit like I'm asking you to imagine a flying unicorn or something, but please indulge me. Measuring quality and efficiency are gargantuan problems, but they're problems that we must solve. As a society, we have a moral as well as fiscal responsibility to transform our healthcare system into one that values quality and efficiency as opposed to volume and waste. And we can't even begin down that path until we can measure those concepts. Now, our government, along with dozens of organizations, both public and private, for-profit and not-for-profit, have invested and are continuing to invest enormous amounts of resources into solving that measurement problem. I truly believe that we'll get there. But when we do, will we know how to use those measures to drive better health, better care, and lower costs? It feels like we're searching for enlightenment. But unless we carefully plan how to put these measurements to good use, we might not get there. So for the rest of my session today, I'll be talking about strategies and challenges with getting patients into the doctors of, into the offices of high quality providers and high value providers, while assuming that we have some way to identify who those providers are. So we've got the report card and we know who's getting A's. What comes next? Well, one strategy that's gained significant traction among healthcare payers in recent years is that of building a high performing narrow network. The idea here is simple. If the only providers that a patient has to choose from are high value, then the patient will have no choice but to seek high value care. Of course, in reality, there are significant constraints uh, that make building a network consisting only of quote unquote high value providers um, impossible. So first off is contracting. For the most part, health plans can't pick and choose which individual providers they want to contract with and include in their network based on measures of performance. Rather, health plans contract with uh, provider groups and health systems. And even if the majority of providers in such a system are high value, there are bound to be some slackers who will end up included in the network as a result of these contracting constraints. Next, there are regulatory constraints. CMS imposes network adequacy requirements that require every member of a plan to have providers of certain specialties within a minimum mileage and driving time of their homes. This could force a plan to include a healthcare provider in their network who, based solely on measures of value, they'd prefer to exclude. Lastly, patients have their own preferences for providers and health systems. Anecdotally, members tend to care a lot about whether their local prestigious academic medical center is included in their plan's network. Now, these academic medical centers tend to face higher costs due to the need to recruit and retain top talent and to uh, research and train, and these tr translate into higher prices. Now, the evidence as to whether these higher prices lead to higher quality care and better outcomes, especially for routine care, is limited at best. So a plan could find itself in a situation where it needs to include one of these medical centers in its network in order to attract and retain membership, but then this sort of undermines the value of curating a narrow network in the first place. So now I want to talk through a simple example of how creating a narrow network in the face of the constraints that I just described can lead to unexpected and unintended negative consequences. So let's imagine a very simple world where there are three providers and we can measure value in stars. So one provider is low value, they're one star. We have a, an average value provider who's two stars and then a rock star, four star value provider. So suppose you're a health plan in this world and you want to build a network and that due to network adequacy uh, restrictions, you have to include that low value one star provider. And you've also got to include at least two of these three available providers. So this leaves you with sort of two reasonable options. One is to uh, have an all inclusive network that includes all these providers and you would calculate that this would lead to an average value of the providers in your network of two and one third stars. Uh, alternatively, you could choose to cut out the mediocre provider and you'd calculate that this would lead to an average value of two and a half stars. So being the smart data-driven decision maker that you are, uh, you choose the second option and you curate a high-performing narrow network for your health plan. Now, suppose that there are two members who enroll in your plan. If you had gone with the broad network that included all available providers, one of these members would have seen the two-star provider and the other would see the four-star provider. Uh, leading to an average value of the care received by members in your network of three stars. But 
you chose to cut out the mediocre provider and build a high-performing narrow network. And as a result of this, the, the member who would otherwise have seen the two-star provider sees the one-star low-value provider instead, leading to an average value of the care received by members in your network of two and a half stars. So due to your decision to cut out lower value providers from your network whenever possible, you've actually found yourself in a situation where the average value of care received by members in your network has decreased. So this may sound like sort of an obscure theoretical possibility with very little connection to the real world. However, my colleagues at Nuna and I uh, did a simulation study for a real health plan who was interested in building a narrow network based on measures of performance uh, for a new plan that they were launching. Uh, we built a hypothetical narrow network for them based on existing measures of value and subjecting ourselves to real-world constraints such as network adequacy and the need to contract with provider groups and health systems rather than individuals. Then we built an econometric model of how members would choose among the providers in this narrow network uh, using data on members' actual choices of providers in other plans. What we found was that the substitution effect that I just described could actually overwhelm the positive effect of building a network that consisted of higher value providers on average, leading to a decrease in the average value of care received by members in their network. So I hate to discuss the results of a real empirical study without being able to uh, show, show you any of them, but that's the nature of data use agreements in industry. So <laughs> I hope you'll take my word for it when I say that uh, the story I just told is more than a theoretical curiosity. It matters empirically, and it matters a lot. So what do we learn from this? Well, one thing that I think we learned from these findings is that patients don't choose doctors based on our measures of value. Well, if I were a behavioral economist, I would probably point to sort of breakdowns in the traditional economic assumptions of consumer rationality to explain this. Uh, and if I were a classical economist, I would probably point to the lack of transparent information about uh, provider value on the basis of which members could choose. If I were an academic, I'd probably care a lot about which of these uh, two explanations was more salient in the, in the population and, and in the study at hand, but I don't, uh, which might be why I'm not an academic. To me, it seems a lot more important to provide patients with decision support and help to choose the right providers for them than it does to understand why they need that help in the first place. So another thing that I think we learned from these findings is that it's really important to understand your population and their preferences. Uh, as we've just seen, not having that understanding and therefore not knowing how patient behavior will change when their environment changes can lead to nasty surprises. Uh, whereas having that understanding can prepare you for when a local cardiologist retires and suddenly all of her former patients flock to the big name academic who commands high prices and images everyone who walks through his door. Lastly, I think we learned that narrow networks aren't enough. Uh, while narrow networks are a somewhat useful tool for getting patients to, into the offices of high-value providers. Uh, patients need support and guidance in order to be able to really uh, make those decisions correctly. And tools that can provide that support will be valuable for patients and payers alike. Uh, so what might such tools look like? Well, I doubt that I'm alone when I say that when I'm thinking about which specialist to see or whether to seek specialty care at all, I usually rely on the advice of my primary care physician. How do I choose a primary care physician? Well, if I've got a few hours on my hand, I might attempt to sift through one of these horrific and notoriously outdated provider directories that you can find on the website of every major health plan. Usually I don't have that kind of time, and so I hop on Google Maps and hope that the person closest to me is accepting my insurance. We can do better. What about a tool that used my preferences, my location, my health history, and my demographic information, as well as measurements of the cost effectiveness, quality of care, and track record of patient satisfaction among the primary care physicians closest to me. Shameless plug, uh, Nuna has built such a tool. <laughs> We're currently working on rolling it out to our health plan clients and improving its underlying algorithms. Uh, this was the obvious next step for us when we realized that simply computing and uh, presenting information on provider performance, measures of value, and quality uh, was not sort of actionable enough or, or powerful enough to meet our goals. So I'll close by saying that uh, the road towards making high quality healthcare affordable and, available, and universally available is a long one. But it's one that I'm happy and proud to be walking with many of you here at my side and to be advancing the contribution of data science to that lofty goal. 
Thanks for listening.